This is the Hebrews class, Hebrews, the glorious Jesus, title of the series. This is lesson number nine in that series. Title of this particular lesson, Jesus Greater Than the Jewish Religion, and this is part two in this particular section that we're covering, and if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, open them to Hebrews chapter nine. So in the segment that we are covering in the book of Hebrews, the author is making an argument. His argument is to demonstrate how Jesus is superior to every element of the Jewish religion. He doesn't denigrate the Jewish religion, but he positions Jesus as being superior to every element contained in the Jewish religion, actually the fulfillment of that religion, and as we know, He's making that argument because his readers are being tempted to go back to Judaism. And he's you know, making the argument, no, no, stay with Christianity. It's a much superior religion. It's the fulfillment. And then he breaks it down and he shows how Christianity is superior to uh, Judaism. So in the last section we covered, the writer explained that Jesus was not only superior to Aaron, the original high priest, but also that Jesus' ministry was superior than the Aaronic priesthood, meaning the priests that were descended from Aaron. Jesus' ministry was superior to those ministries for the following reasons. Uh, the writer says, the Hebrew writer says that Jesus ministered in heaven. He ministered in a, in a better place. He was in the actual sanctuary, the true sanctuary, not, not necessarily the uh, not simply, rather, the earthly sanctuary, the, the man-made sanctuary, which was the shadow, not the real thing. Jesus ministered in heaven, not here on earth. Secondly, um, uh, Jesus ministered according to a better covenant. In other words, He was the agent of a better promise, which had better features than the old uh, covenant, the Old Testament. Uh, for example, the new promise, the new covenant was inward and it was spiritual in nature. In other words, individual hearts would be changed, not just a, a religious practice. You didn't just change religion, your heart would be changed with this new covenant. Uh, it was also personal and universal in nature. In other words, everybody would have access to God with this new covenant, not just the special ministers. In other words, not just the high priest could go into the sanctuary and be close to God. According to this new promise, this new covenant, everybody could go close to God. It's as if you know, everybody could just go into the sanctuary at, uh, in the temple. And then he said that uh, in this new covenant, uh, one of the promises uh, was that the covenant would deal effectively with sin. Uh, it wasn't simply a covenant to help people remember their sins, but a promise uh, that with this covenant, people would be free from their sins and therefore free from the guilt of their sins. Uh, you know, better results um, that he's talking about. So in the final chapter and a half of this first part of Hebrews, the author is going to continue building on his theme of the superiority of Jesus, uh, his ministry, uh, and he's going to establish this with two final ideas. First of all, Jesus' work Right? His ministry, his sacrifice is done in a better place by a better covenant and is superior. And then secondly, the results of Jesus' ministry on our behalf are superior than the results of the ministry that were performed by the Aaronic priesthood on behalf of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. So these two ideas are not presented, like I'm, you know, I'm doing it West, Western civilization style. You know? Uh, number one, A, B, number two, A, B, that's how we kind of think you know, in the West. The, the Eastern style is more um, holistic, if you wish. These two ideas were, uh, were being uh, uh, woven into the fabric of his narrative, his discussions, okay? So you need to be looking for these two ideas kind of flowing through what he's saying. So uh, we now uh, move, or he now moves to the actual place where these sacrifices were uh, offered in the Old Testament, the actual tabernacle or the temple in chapter nine. So he begins by reviewing the worship elements um, that um, uh, were used and serviced 
uh, by the Old Testament priests. So let's start chapter nine, beginning in verse one. It says, now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstead and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, uh, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, but of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So he talks about the Old Testament and the place where the sacrifices in the Old Testament were offered. And so um, he talks first of all about you know, the tabernacle, the tent you know, that was in the, uh, in the wilderness, uh, some of the features of the tent, uh, only some, you know, only, the only source of light was the lampstand that was in the, uh, in the, um, in the tabernacle. Uh, the showbread was on the uh, north wall, always set before the, uh, the Lord, 12, uh, 12 um, hang on a second, uh, uh, 12 um, uh, loaves of bread, uh, one per tribe. Somebody's wondering why 12? Well, 12 tribes, 12 loaves of bread, uh, freshly made every Sabbath, uh, and the old loaves were eaten by the uh, priests. On the inside, the Holy of Holies had two pieces of uh, furniture. Uh, the altar of incense, which may have been placed directly in front of the veil. Here's the, the veil you see, you know, that, second, uh, that second line there. That's the veil that separates uh, the two rooms. The other veil was the entrance into the holy place. Um, as we say, the altar of incense, which may have been placed directly in front of the veil in the outer compartment, so the smoke that they burnt or that came from the incense would, would work itself into the Holy of Holies. And then there was the, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, four feet by two and a half by two and a half feet. Uh, this is a rendition of it. Uh, the Ark contained Aaron's rod, which miraculously budded. We know that story, and then a jar of manna. Uh, these, were, uh, these two items were lost with time. Uh, in addition to these two things um, were the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone, they were still in the ark. And these two tablets were still in the ark by the time of Solomon. When Solomon built his temple many years later, these two tablets were still in the ark. We read about that in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 9. The ark was covered by a lid decorated with two angels that were facing each other and their wings touched. Um, it was called the mercy seat, that cover, that cover part, that was called the mercy seat because it was here that the high priest sprinkled the blood on the day of atonement and made possible the reconciliation between man and God, and that's why it was called the mercy seat. You know, man found mercy at the mercy seat because the blood of the animals, the blood of the sacrifice, were sprinkled on this part of the, uh, of the ark. Uh, the uh, writer goes on to talk about the work of the priests in verses six to 10. He says, now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship, but into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in uh, ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So now the author goes on to describe the type of work and ministry that the high priest did in these surroundings that I've just described to you. Um, the priests went into the outer compartment every day to trim the lamps morning and evening and also to offer incense morning and evening 
and then each Sabbath in order to replace the showbread, that was their work. Into the inner sanctuary, they could only go once per year and then only the high priest could go once per year. He would first offer incense, then he would offer blood for his own sins, because he was a sinner, and then at last he would offer, you know, sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice for the sins of the people. The author says that the significance of this type of ministry by its very nature is to demonstrate that man cannot come near to God. And so long as this system of religion stood, it was a testimony that the way to God was blocked. And so the tabernacle and especially the outer compartment represented how separate the people were from God. Yes, it was highly elaborate and it was beautiful, gold and you know, precious things and metals and so on and so forth were made to, to construct the tabernacle and then later on the temple, but the idea of it con continually reminded the people, you cannot come near God. I mean, the high priest could only come into the presence of God once per year, and only the high priest, once per year. Imagine, if you will, that you could only pray once per year. You know, as Christians, we have this idea, if I have a need, you know, morning, noon, or night, no matter where I am, I can stop and I, Lord, I need your help now. Lord, you know, Lord, what a beautiful morning. I offer praise to you. you know, your, your works are magnificent. Praise be to you. you know, imagine if you could only utter words like that, in other words, being in the presence of God, one time per year. And what if only one representative from your entire nation could only go before God one time per year? So the, the entire elaborate system that was there in the Old Testament was there to demonstrate to the people they could not come near to God and that they were sinners. How did they get that idea? Well, morning and night, <laughs> the priests were offering sacrifices because of sin. And there were any number of uh, sacrifices that were offered for all kinds of offenses, all kinds of reason. It was a, a highly, you know, it was a, a, it was a heavy burden to carry. All the details of, of the sacrificial system and the priestly system, I mean, it took up so much time, so much energy, so much wealth. And so at this point, the writer is going to move forward. Oh, excuse me, I, 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 skipped the, I skipped the part there. So um, uh, the writer you know, says that all of this here uh, couldn't cleanse the conscience. All these rituals, they were for the external religious cleanings. They were done you know, in order, to, um, uh, 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 in order to, to take care of uh, uh, things that people had done if they had come in contact with a dead body. They were unclean and a, a, a woman would be on her uh, monthly cycle and she was unclean, you know, those type of things. These rituals were enabling people to be ceremonial, uh, ceremonially clean. In other words, being able to participate at some point in the worship of the nation. But the writer in Hebrew says, these external religious cleansing um, were done simply to remind you of your sin and to cleanse you from eternal, uh, external things, but they couldn't cleanse your conscience. They couldn't do that. And so the writer talks about a time of reformation. Uh, he's not talking about the Protestant reformation here. <laughs> reformation was the time of the Christian age. It is as though people of the Old Covenant, aware of its inadequacy, looked forward when all things would be put right. Okay. And the author is saying put right, he uses the word reformation, when things would be put right. They were looking forward to a time. And so by this time, the author is going to get to Jesus' ministry and now describe it in comparison to the priest's ministry. So he moves forward to describe Jesus' ministry as the high priest, and he talks about the effectiveness 
of His sacrifice. Verse 11, he says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through His own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So the author says that Jesus ministers in the same way as the other high priests, you know, by offering sacrifice for sin. However, in verse, uh, however, he offers sacrifice in the heavenly sanctuary as one who can come before God, because as the Son of God, he can enter into heaven. The high priest couldn't do that. Secondly, he offers his own perfect eternal life for the sins of men, not the, not the, the life of, of animals. And thirdly, um, a more valuable payment is made. In other words, a more valuable sacrifice is made, thus obtaining a much more valuable outcome. The outcome of the sacrifices of the high priest cleansed externally, you know, the ceremonial cleanliness. And it was a kind of a down payment as to what was to come in the future. But Jesus' sacrifice, once and for all, the, the bill is paid once and for all, it doesn't have to be repeated over and over and over again. The price for sin is paid forever, rather than simply a reprieve from one year to the next as the high priest went in to offer the you know, the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. That was just a reprieve from one year, you know, kicking the can down the road, so to speak. One year after another, that's what the high priest had done. The author says, waiting for the time of reformation till things would be made right. And when Jesus came, the final sacrifice, once and for all, uh, was made. So we continue reading verse 13, he says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. Now he's talking about you know, the external, the ceremonial cleansing that they needed. He says, if the blood of bulls and goats did that, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to, to serve the living God? And so the author, compares the two sacrifices in a positive way. He says, he agrees that according to the law, animal sacrifice, it was effective to render acceptable before God those who had violated some aspects of the eternal ritual of, of, of religion in the Old Testament. It worked. If someone had touched a dead body or a dead animal or something like that, and become, had become defiled, they couldn't participate in the normal worship, the normal life of, of, the, of that society, they would go and they would offer the sacrifice and they would receive the ceremonial cleansing necessary, you know, and they could re-enter uh, you know, normal life. So he says, it worked, it did its job. But one who had come into, uh, as I say, it did his job, the point that he's making here is if the blood or the life of an animal could do this, imagine what the sacrifice of the Son of God could do. Imagine what His blood could accomplish. Not just remove the stigma from breaking ritualistic laws, but also the guilt and fear resulting from breaking God's eternal spiritual laws. The implication is that once cleansed by this sacrifice, the individual was free from condemnation, from guilt, from fear, and free to serve God with a spirit of enthusiasm, not a, a spirit of slavery. So here's where the sacrifice of Christ proves its efficiency in the fact that it creates a change in the hearts of men. The Old Testament sacrifices uh, uh, affected a change in what a man or a woman could do or could not do as far as function you know, within that society. But the sacrifice of Christ goes much deeper than that and changes the man, changes the woman themselves as far as how they relate to God. Now the reason for the sacrifice. So the author has made his case by demonstrating where Jesus ministers is better, heaven, 
And what He does in His ministry is better. He redeems souls, not just ceremonial law. Um, and the climax of his argument is that uh, you know, his sacrifice is better than the priest's sacrifice, but he has, he's got one more point that he wants to make to his readers because they're Jews. And the question is this, why did Jesus have to die? Why did God choose this way to, you know, uh, to take care of man's problem? You see, for Jews, the death of the Messiah was the greatest obstacle to their faith. I mean, if He was the Messiah, the one promised in Scripture, why did He have to die? I mean, they understood the idea that He came to save, to save people. He got that out. That's why He's the Messiah. You know? They got that part, but they, they didn't understand the part where He had to die. Okay? So the author gives them two reasons. Uh, in verse um, 15, let's see, yeah, verse 15. Well, first of all, he said the first reason is sacrifice for sin requires death. That's the, why did he have to die? Because the, the eternal principle says a sacrifice for sin requires death. It's a spiritual law. It's like the law of gravity. You know, the law of gravity says you take something and you drop it, boop, it'll always go down. I can do this 50 times, right? It'll always be the same, right? Why? Because the law of gravity takes, takes over. Somebody over here says, well, I don't believe in the law of gravity. Oh, really? Watch this. Yeah, well, I still don't believe in the law of gravity. Oh, yeah? Well, it's a stupid law. I'm going to ignore the law of gravity, right? OK, sure, go ahead. <laughs> to your own detriment, well, in the same way, there are spiritual laws. And one of the spiritual laws says, you sin, you die. Another spiritual law says, the sacrifice for sin is death. You want, you want to buy back life? You have to give a life in order to buy back a life. Adam was perfect, created perfect, what did he do? He sinned and he forfeited his life. Because the law, the spiritual law says, you sin, you die. So he sinned, the law kicked in, he dies. Meaning he's separated from God. Someone says, well, I want to buy that back. What do I have to pay? Well, he forfeited a perfect life. So how do I, how do I buy it back? You offer a perfect life to buy back a perfect life. That's, that's the rule. That's the, that's, that's the principle there. Uh, and this is what the author is, is talking about. Sacrifice for sin requires death. The penalty for sin is death, and in order to redeem or to buy back a man's soul, Jesus had to pay for it with his life. The fact that his life was spiritual and thus eternal means that it purchased not only forgiveness for sins on the day that it's offered, like animals, you know, but also it obtains forgiveness for all time. You see, because he had a perfect life, he was able to offer it in exchange for one life. But because his life, his nature was divine, he was the divine Son of God, the value of his life was worth not just one person, it was worth every person. Because his spirit was eternal, he was the son of God, it meant that his sacrifice was valid not only at, on the moment that he offered it, but at that it would be valid every single day until the end of time. Unlike an animal, an animal, you gave its life, it was valid, but it was valid only on that day because the next day you had to offer another animal and the next day you had to offer another animal. You see what I'm saying? So the author is saying, Sacrifice, why did he die? Because sacrifice for sin requires a life. And so Jesus offers his life. This sacrifice is what obtains for us forgiveness and consequently eternal life and joy and peace and so on and so forth. And these blessings are referred to as an inheritance reserved for those who are called. Now, I need to open a little uh, parenthetical statement here just to help us understand how the writer is writing what he's writing. 
the author uses two meanings for the word covenant in Hebrews. Uh, 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 one time he uses the term covenant, right? The promises that God makes and assure the covenant. And then other times he uses the term a will. You know, like I have a will, I've left so and so to my son or daughter a will. And so he uses these interchangeably. So you need to understand when he's talking about a will, he's talking about the covenant. When he's talking about the covenant, he's talking about the will, okay, back and forth. So that'll help us, uh, that'll help us understand. So when he talks about blessings, he refers to all the blessings we receive from God as an inheritance that are reserved for those who are called. And how are we called? Well, through the gospel. God calls everybody through the gospel. And we obtain our inheritance prepared by God for us and paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus. All right, so let's keep those ideas. So why did he have to die? Well, sacrifice for sin requires death. Number two, uh, excuse me, I need to read the passage. It says, for this reason he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. So that's what I was talking about. The blessings that we get because we are saved, he refers to these as the inheritance. All right, second reason he had to die. Death is required in order to activate the will. Or we could say death is required in order to activate the covenant. Same thing. So it brings us to the second reason for his death. In order for a will to be executed and the people to receive their inheritance, there needs to be a death of the principal party. So in verses 16 to 21, the writer says that it was necessary for Jesus to die because without his death, the will or the testament which grants us our inheritance would not come to effect, would not come into effect. Of course, I have a will and all our kids know what's in the will, but they're not getting their hands on it till I'm gone, you know what I'm saying? Because I get to use it for a while. Let's just hope there's something left, you know. <laughs> so let's read how he puts this in verse 16. He says, for where a covenant is, or a will, right? So where a covenant is, there must necessarily be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all of the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you, and in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So, he demonstrates that even the first covenant, the Old Testament, was put into effect when animal sacrifices were made and the actual external elements of the faith were sprinkled with blood. Remember when they built the tabernacle and they put everything in place, you know, Moses was there, Aaron was there, everything was ready. They hadn't used it yet. And what was the first thing that Moses did? Well, they sacrificed an animal and every piece of furniture and the tabernacle itself on the table and the ark, everything was sprinkled with blood. Why? Well, because they were activating that covenant. They were, in other words, they were putting into process, they were putting to work that old covenant or that first covenant. In other words, you know, the, the, the offering of an animal uh, cleansed the individual from some sort of ceremonial uncleanness. Well, for that to work, the sacrifice, the system, and all the elements had to be first sprinkled with blood. That's what activated it, made it work. Well, his, his point that he's making is the same thing happened in the second covenant, the new covenant. All the promises and the work and the, you know, the inheritance that we're going to get and eternal life and forgiveness of sins, the reception of the Holy Spirit, all those gifts 
don't come into play until what? The elements are sprinkled with blood. Whose blood? Jesus' blood. How? On the cross. So that cross, that death, starts the, the covenant, puts it into play. So he summarizes his argument by saying that there is no cleansing or forgiving without the shedding of blood or the offer of life. By the way, someone says, why the shedding of blood? What, what's the issue about that? It's because uh, death, the, the, the killing of something, is how you transfer something from the physical dimension into the spiritual dimension. Okay? How, how do you get the payment for something done from the earth, from the world, from the physical world, into the spiritual world where God is? Well, through death. Death is the door from this life, this dimension, into the next dimension. That's why it's death, that's why. It's the, it's the vehicle that transfers something from here to there. All right? So in the Old Testament, they did it with animals. Now Jesus has done it also. This is why He had to die. He was the Messiah, but God's plan was that the Savior would save by offering His life. Why? He didn't do that arbitrarily, because He fulfilled you know, those spiritual laws that are in place. If you sin, you die. You can only purchase a life with a life. Those laws are like gravity. They're eternal law. You can't suspend them. And so he talks about the superiority of Jesus' sacrifice, verse 23 and 24. He says, therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. 24. He says, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So the tabernacle and the religious objects were purified with an animal sacrifice, but Jesus who enters the true tabernacle where actually God is present, He needs to come with a better sacrifice, not animal blood. The earthly temple with a sacrifice of flesh, uh, you know, had a sacrifice of a fleshly nature. The heavenly temple needs a sacrifice of a spiritual nature, like Christ's nature. Verse 25 and 6, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the priests, they offered numerous sacrifices over the centuries of animals given to them by the people. But now at the appointed time, Christ has offered himself and his eternal sacrifices. He's done it once for all time. Why? because his sacrifice was perfect and it was of an eternal nature. No, you can't beat that. You can't beat that sacrifice. Nothing better than that. He doesn't go in and out of the temple, but he does his service once, and here's the difference. He stays in the sanctuary. The priest would go in once a year and come out, go in once a year and come out. Jesus goes in to the heavenly sanctuary, offers his sacrifice, and he stays there, he sits. He sits down where? At the right hand of God. And that imagery there, well, it's an image for us, but it's a true spiritual reality. That reality is, and what it means rather, is that his sacrifice is done. There's no more sacrifices to give. He sat down, his work is done. 27. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await Him. So all men die once, according to God's plan, and then are judged. Jesus, as a man, also died only once, but His death was not on account of sin, of course, his death was as a sacrifice for sin. All men will return to be judged after their death. And Jesus as God's Son will also return, but not in connection with sin. This He's already dealt with at the cross. 
when He returns next time, it'll be to gather those who faithfully have followed Him and to bring them to heaven where He has entered in. You know, when He says, I go to prepare a place for us, the Hebrew writer is telling us when He did that. When He went and brought His sacrifice, He went into the holy place. That's the place that He prepared for us. You know, that, that business, well, am I going to have a big room or a small room? We're going to have front row seat, a back row seat? No, 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 no. That's earthly thinking. Well, where are we going to be in heaven? The right hand of God. Well, what's the right hand of God? Well, that's within the Godhead. Are you telling me that God has done something historically that will enable me, a human being, to have a glorified body and then to become part of the Godhead? Uh, yeah, that's the end game. Why do you think we're here? What do you think we're waiting for? What's the point of having glorious bodies? To do what? We have to have glorious bodies in order to be able to survive being in that proximity with God. That's what that's about. But that's for another lesson and another day. Okay, three minutes, four minutes to go. Let's just summarize what we've said. I mean, it's a mouthful, eh? You know, it's a lot in one shot. So let's just summarize a little bit here, okay? Number one, the author compares Jesus' work and ministry with that of Old Testament priests. He, he says, Jesus offers his, sac uh, his sacrifice in heaven, they offer it on earth. Jesus' sacrifice is eternal, those is temporal, or theirs is temporal. His sacrifice removes the guilt of sin, those only ritual impurity, and really as a reminder of sin. Number two, the author gives two reasons why the Messiah had to die. Reason number one, sin is paid for by offering a sacrifice, and a sacrifice can only be offered through death. Remember, that's how you transfer stuff from one dimension to the other. And two, promises contained in the will prepared by God for us needed a death to put those into effect. And we don't have to wait till the end of the world. They're already in effect. We have the Holy Spirit. We have forgiveness. We have peace. We have promise. We have a guarantee. We, we have. There's still some gifts to open up. You know? We don't know exactly what the glorified body is going to be like. We can't quite know what the experience of life is to be at the right hand of God with Jesus. You know, we, we get a little taste of that every once in a while. But we, 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 we've started opening up the gifts. And then the third thing that we talked about, uh, he summarizes Jesus' superior ministry. Better sacrifice offered in a better place. One-time sacrifice for all sin, never to be repeated. And then finally, Jesus will return not to be judged. Like the priests, they're going to be judged because they're human. But when Jesus returns, He returns to gather the saved in order to bring them to heaven. In other words, He comes back as the Messiah. Okay? All right, so next week we're going to uh, the final section of part one, then we're going to move on through this epistle. Now, as I said to you, it's, it's a lot. You know, so even, even spending a quarter on Hebrews, even then we're having to move very quickly because there are a lot of great ideas here, marvelous ideas, uh, things that we could talk about for a long time. But hopefully what the author has said, hopefully I've tried to convey this to you and it's uh, clear for now. If it isn't, let me know and I will clarify it as we go along. All right, that's our lesson for tonight, thanks.